tonight on the final play. Breeze retreats in the shotgun, throwing, and it's going to be intercepted. The Saints have extra time to recover from an extra painful loss. We still have a, a ton of football left, so we're playing for that opportunity, just like Atlanta, just like everyone else. Jeff Duncan joins us to look ahead at the Saints' home stretch and what LSU can achieve with a strong Citrus Bowl showing against Notre Dame. Plus... <laughs> Edna Carr takes home their second straight class for a title, while West St. John High School wins their first state championship since 2004. We've got a full recap of the eight local teams competing in the Dome this weekend. We'll look back at this and we'll say, oh my God, I can't believe we did that. Well, we did it. And see how the Pelicans respond to Friday's collapse to the Kings as they welcome the Philadelphia 76ers and LSU product Ben Simmons to town. From Fox 8 Sports, this is the final play. Sponsored by your Southern Quality Ford dealer, built Ford Tough, and Nissan. Welcome into the final play. I'm Juan Kincaid, and scoreboard watching was the thing to do today. With the Saints enjoying a much-needed extended break from the field following Thursday night's loss in Atlanta, this team came away from that defeat with a bunch of injuries, but still with all to play for. Sean Mazan gets us started tonight. Fake the end around, set up the screen to Kamara, and Kamara is going to be taken down. He took a big-time shot there up high. It was exactly what players fear about Thursday night football. Short rest leading to numerous injuries. At one point, the Saints had nine players leave their game against the Falcons. It's 100% a product of playing on Thursday night. Do you understand what guys' bodies go through, you know, in a game? And then to have to turn around four days later and to play? I mean, look at the injury studies. They're off the charts. They're off the charts. So is, is, this, is this smart as it pertains to guys' health and safety? No, absolutely not. What do you guys think? <laughs> Seriously, speak up. What do you guys think? What do you think there were so many injuries tonight? Anyone? Huh? Short week. Um, anyway, credit Atlanta. They came back, showed some heart, got a big win. Uh, it was disappointing for us. Of course, that was only part of the Saints' problem. The other, officiating, which was disastrous. Saints were flagged 11 times. Nine of them resulted in Falcons' first downs. Clearly, we, we had the, you know, third and sixth situation. We had ability to get back and take a chance, um, and that was taken away from us. I don't, I don't know how you say that. Um, at the end of the day, again, we should never let them get close. And we should have had, you know, those three points going into this, going into the half. Uh, you know, you call it how you see it. Apparently, they they were calling it in not in our favor. Um, it is, it is what it is. There was plenty of uh, phantom calls, uh, and of course, there was, you know, there was uh, times where you know we were being held and we weren't getting called for it. There was, uh, there was a time where uh, defense got a holding call, where as my D tackle had his whole uh, jersey ripped on the side. Um, but of course, I think we saw again at the end of the day, uh, we didn't do enough to to win the game. But what's done is done. The Saints must move on. At nine and four, there's still plenty to play for, like the NFC South crown. They still control their own destiny in the division, but the margin for error is shrinking. The Panthers had the same record at 9-4 after their big win over Minnesota, while the Falcons sit just one game behind them at 8-5 with the Christmas Eve meeting on the horizon. So despite the tough loss on Thursday, everything they want is still attainable. So now is the time to buckle down and finish strong. The question is, how healthy will they be down the stretch? Alvin Kamara is in concussion protocol. A.J. Klein will reportedly miss some time. Trey Hendrickson is reportedly out three weeks. Senio Calamete and Kenny Vaccaro both left and did not return Thursday. While Andrus Pete was already out with a groin injury. Injuries are a part of football, and it looks like the Saints will deal with them during the most crucial stretch of the season. I'm Sean Fazan for the final play. Always nice to have with us Jeff Duncan from NOLA.com and the Times Picking Union and also his radio show, Duncan Holder, with our other colleague, Larry Holder. Let's look back for a second first with this game with Atlanta. A loss to them, a hiccup, or sign of something to come? I think it's just a hiccup right now, Juan. This team played well in that game, easily could have won the game, and they had so much adversity with injuries and penalties and things that normally they don't really have to overcome. Yeah. And they still almost had a chance to pull this game out to me. I saw a lot of encouraging signs 
for the future. Uh, losing to your arch rival in a game they had to have on the road in a hostile environment in prime time by three points, it's not bad. Not bad at all. And I would imagine you were in the locker room when Sean Payton said, I don't know what you're talking about when it comes to the whole choking thing, but we all saw it on television. What do you make of the gesture to Devonta Freeman? Well, you know, it's not the first time Sean Payton has gotten a back and forth situation during a game with an opposing player. I've seen him do it with Sean, uh, Steve Smith, I'm sorry, for the Carolina Panthers. He's done it with other coaches. Yeah. I mean, he's a very emotional coach. That's why his players like him so much. And I think this one, he might have crossed the line a little bit, but that's Sean Payton. That's what, that's, the, that's what you get. That's part of the package with him. And I think if he looked back at it, he probably feels bad, but that's just him in the heat of the moment making you know, making an emotional move. Not that this rivalry seems to need a spark, but maybe this gives it the kind of spark it needs, and can it be a rivalry when you've lost three in a row? Oh, it's definitely a rivalry. I mean, it's, I think this game, uh, Christmas Eve, between oh, the fantastic. Saints and Falcons, oh. it's going to be off the charts. I mean, it's already amped up anyway. There's so much on the line. But now with all the emotions going back and forth between both sides, uh, I think it's going to be an incredible environment, and I think this will always always be a huge uh, you know emotional rivalry and you mentioned a minute ago about all the injuries in this game they were going down like flies and it didn't seem like anybody from Atlanta got hurt even though somebody did but Drew Brees said afterwards he thinks the injuries are direct effect from only getting four days rest and playing that Thursday night game first of all do you agree with that and secondly might we see a change in 2021 when the CBA is up to this Thursday night game I don't think it's gonna go away Juan. I it's think a money thing isn't yeah it? it's money I mean the league makes a lot of money on these Thursday night games and that package I think there's some validity to what Drew Brees is saying, particularly with soft tissue injuries like the groin injury that yeah. A.J. Klein suffered, and the same injury uh, that Kenny Vaccaro had. Those need time to recover, and, and it, that recovery time is compressed because of the early kickoff. But the other injuries, the concussions that we saw, I think those are just part yeah. of the game. I don't see how they can be eliminated by playing two or three games later. Uh, that's a violent game that these, these players are playing. And I don't think Thursday night or Sunday is going to prevent it, whatever you play it. Alvin Kamara, one of the players that had the concussion early on, it was tough to see him go out because so much was talked about Kamara versus Ingram against this Atlanta defense. But I would imagine of all the injuries the Saints have right now, that's the one you're really worried about because it affects the offense so much. Yeah, they're not the same offense without Alvin Kamara. That was evident yeah. on Thursday night. Uh, he is the best playmaker on this team right now. He's a rare playmaker on the perimeter in the receiving game and as a running back and I think it's different though I would say when you lose him in the middle of the game and your game plan has already been designed with yeah. him in the picture if he's not in the picture you have time to drop some different plays without him uh, but certainly that was a blow to them on Thursday night they've got to get him back the good thing is they've got extra time yeah. for him to get out of concussion protocol are you surprised that they struggled to adjust to life without Kamara even though he went out of the game very early no, I'm not because, I mean, it happened in the middle of the game and you'd have to tear up your game plan. It's impossible to do during a game. And I think Atlanta's defense played very well. They had a good game plan for the Saints. Uh, but we're losing a guy like that in the middle of the game, uh, early in the game like they did, it's very tough. So everything around the Saints right now, it's, it's crowded. With the Panthers beating the Vikings early today, now you've got the Panthers tied with the Saints. Our colleague Jim Henderson said last week, I asked him, said, are you still trying to chase one and two? And he said, no, you got to watch the teams that are behind you or around you. That seems to be the case, especially right now, but you're still keeping an eye on the guys in front of you a little bit, right? Yeah, well, I got, the way I think, I agree with Jim, the way this team needs to look at it is win the division. Win the NFC South division. Win those final two games in your division. And I think everything will take care of itself. Right now, it's so competitive in the NFC, even with three games to play, that it's impossible to figure out who's going to win where. A lot of these teams are playing each other the rest of the way. The Saints, I think, have a great shot to win out. And if they finish 12-4, and four, I'll be surprised if they are not in the top four seeds. I just don't know if it'll be good enough to get one of the top two seeds in that home field advantage. Well, we're going to leave it right there with the Saints with Jeff Dunk of NOAA.com and the Times Picayune. Much more with him coming up, including his thoughts on LSU and what playing in the Citrus Bowl, again, means for the program going forward. Our catch of the week is from Thursday night's game in Atlanta and how the Saints' comeback came to an abrupt end. Deion Jones, Debo picking off Drew Brees in the end zone to seal the game for the Falcons. If we're searching for positives, how about Jones has deep local ties, having prepped at Jesuit and later played at LSU. 
Speaking of which, Jones's Tigers have one more game to get ready for, a Citrus Bowl kickoff on New Year's Day. All right, back inside with Jeff Duncan from NOLA.com and the Tides Picking Union and the radio show Duncan Holder. And when we're talking about LSU, it seems like a 10-win season is what the minimum is expected. Getting back to the Citrus Bowl again, is that a good thing for this football team? Well, I think it's definitely a good thing when you consider where they came from about a month into yeah, the season. Troy, yeah. I think anybody would have taken it after they lost to Troy at home. Uh, they ran the table for the most part except for the Alabama game and took care of business. And I, I think you can make an argument, Juan, that this is the best game outside the New Year's Day Six mm -hmm. Bowls. It's a quality opponent against Notre Dame. It's going to be high profile. I'm sure it's going to get a lot of viewership. And that always going to help recruiting. So I think they can cap it off with a big win against Notre Dame. I think it points up. The program's pointed up for the future. The assumption when the season began, based on how he played last year in replacement of, of uh, Leonard Fournette, was that Darius Geis is going to be one more year and done. And he didn't have quite the season that he would have liked. But it still seems to me that he's a guy that's going to be taken within the first two, three rounds. What do you make of him not tipping his hand right now in his future and really kind of saying he's leaning towards possibly coming back next year? Yeah, that surprises me. I'll be shocked if he comes back. I mean, there's really nothing for him to gain. Exactly. He's projected as probably a first or second round draft mm -hmm. pick, and uh, there's nothing left for him to do but come back and get hurt yeah. and hurt his draft stock. So I think it would be a surprise to see him come back. But I do like the fact that he wants to play in this bowl game and be there for his teammates. It'll be our last opportunity to see the senior Danny Atling play at quarterback. Might we see Miles Brennan or will Ogeron say, you know what, this is your game to win or lose because it's your last game? Well, who knows? I mean, it seems week to week they, they change the quarterback situation, the rotation. Sometimes we see Miles Brennan, sometimes we don't. Uh, they love Danny Etling, and I think they want Danny Etling to go out with a victory in this game. Is it Miles Brennan's? job to lose next year is he the answer for this team at quarterback you know have I, you seen enough to say that I don't think we've seen enough how do we know I yeah. mean he hasn't played enough he hasn't played in the in the you know line of fire in the SEC week to week and look Lowell Narcisse is a highly regarded prospect as well that I think also is going to factor into that mix but one of these guys has to rise up and become the leader next year and that'll be done in the spring ball going forward right now I don't think we know what we've got in Miles Brennan. Last thing, will next season be a no excuses season for Ogeron? The, honey, the, the honeymoon's over. Oh, well, it's always, I think, yeah. the honeymoon's over at LSU. You've got to win, and you've got to win big. It doesn't help that you're in the same division as Alabama, the Goliath of college football right now. But Auburn's not going anywhere right now, and Georgia's building a power, so the SEC is going to be very top heavy. LSU needs to be in that mix. They need to continue to recruit well. But the one thing I would say is, Everything else that's gone on in the division, with Florida and Tennessee, all these other coaching changes, Texas A&M, Arkansas, suddenly LSU looks stable yeah, by exactly. comparison. You're right. And I think that's a good thing going forward. All right, and we'll leave it there going forward. Jeff Duncan, NOLA.com, and the Times picking you. And Duncan Holder, weekdays from? 10 to noon every day. 10 to noon. Thanks, Jeff. Appreciate it. My pleasure, Juan. Thanks. Coming up, high school football crowned a bunch of champions over the past three days, and some of them were local teams. Chris Hagan will take a look back, and later... Can a fiery Alvin Gentry motivate his team enough to beat Ben Simmons and the Philadelphia 76ers tonight? You're watching the final play. Nine state champions etched their name into history this weekend in the Superdome, including several of our local teams. Among their accomplishments, we saw one school win back-to-back -back titles for the first time in school history, while another raised the bar for their program to new heights. Chris Hagen has a full recap from the Dome. We didn't have to wait long for the action in the three-day weekend that is the Prep Classic, as West St. John lived up to their billing as the top seed in Class 1A and defeated Kentwood 20-14. It's special. It's special. Uh, I'm glad for the opportunity for these guys here. The Rams finished with a dominant 11-2 record with their last loss coming all the way back in September. Their tenacious defense that we saw on display all year shined brightest in the dome, forcing several key kangaroo turnovers, none bigger than Coven Barnes' pick six in the second quarter to give them a 13-7 lead. Our defense has been playing really good all year really good all year and we've gotten better and better and better and better and I think there's still some things that, that we can clean up and um, get better at you know for the guys that are, that are coming back. In class 2A it was everyone's favorite spoiler St. Helena going for a state title against Welsh. Coming into the game the Hawks pulled the upset against both the three seed a meet and the second seed fair day. 
but Welsh was another monster entirely. Even a botched field goal attempt resulted in a touchdown as the Greyhounds took a 31-0 lead before St. Helena even got on the scoreboard. The only way we can lose this game is if we beat ourselves, and uh, we went out and we did that. Uh, we turned over the football, we gave up big plays, and we just started slow. But there's no doubt that the Hawks have everyone's attention after a 12-3 and finish. Uh, we just didn't get it done today. Uh, you know, we started slow, but I was very, very proud of my guys. Division 2 on Friday was where the heavy hitters came out. The afternoon game between De La Salle and University Lab out of Baton Rouge was the state's only championship matchup of two undefeated teams, and they didn't disappoint in the first half. The Cavaliers took the lead in the second quarter, courtesy of two very familiar names, Julian Gums to Kendall Collins on a screen pass for 83 yards. However, Collins wasn't the only star running back in this game, as UHI's Mike Hollins found the end zone a few minutes later to reclaim the lead for the Cubs. Then following a Gums fumble, John Gordon McKernan extended UHI's lead before halftime. The second half, to the Cavs' dismay, was all Cubs all the time, starting with another Hollins touchdown to make it 24 to 13, followed by a Mike Martin punt return to put UHI firmly in the driver's seat. The loss isn't the finish that De La Salle or this historic senior class wanted, but they leave the Dome very proud. After all these years, you know, we brought De La Salle to a place that we've never been. Um, we've done things that people thought that we never could do. We uh, proved a lot of people wrong, proved a lot of haters wrong, and I feel like, you know, we, at the end of the day, we are champions, and I'm just proud of my team for fighting strong, even though it didn't go our way. On Saturday, John Curtis and Catholic led things off as the Patriots looked to win their first title since 2013. It appeared they would be on the board first when they recovered a muffed punt in the end zone. However, the rule states that if the ball isn't possessed before it crosses the goal line, it's a touchback, not a touchdown. On the ensuing drive, the Bears would strike with a Cameron Dartez touchdown pass to Austin Hood, a crushing turn of events for Curtis, but not where they lost the game. Oh, it's hard for me to zero in on one play and say that was a difference maker. Did it, did it create some momentum stoppage at that point? It did, okay? Uh, but that wasn't the reason that we lost the ball game. The Patriots would rally courtesy of Colin Guggenheim's touchdown in the third quarter and then an impressive Darian Washington run to tie the game at 14 a bit later. But Catholic ruled the day with special teams and their kicker Preston Stafford was money down the stretch to give them a six-point lead while the Patriots didn't do themselves any favors with turnovers. <laughs> Class 4A, we got another back and forth first half from the defending champion Carr Cougars and undefeated number two seed Lakeshore. Skylar Perry, who went on to win most outstanding player, started the game with a touchdown pass to Anthony Spurlock. Still, Lakeshore was stride for stride with the Cougars through the first half, thanks in large part to Jacob Bernard. First, he returned the kickoff 83 yards after the Spurlock touchdown to tie the game at seven. Then, he was on the receiving end of a deep ball from Chris Pinton to keep them within striking distance. But from there, it was all Carr and their relentless run game. Perry's touchdown dash at the end of the second quarter extended their lead, while Ronnie Action Jackson dominated the second half. Perry, Jackson, and another running back, Ahmad Antoine, all finished with more than 100 yards rushing and combined for six touchdowns on the ground to win 48 to 26. I uh, like do your job players. I think, uh, and that's what that's what you, that's what's sitting up here right now. It's not four and five star players. It's, it's guys who who wanted more, wanted more, uh, play with a lot of hunger, play with a lot of fight. So again, very appreciative of, of everything. Going back to back is great, but guess what? When when you win, people expect you to win more. You know, they they gonna want us to. It's gonna be T-shirts next year for three P. I think our playoff run proved we belong. You know, we didn't come out on top today, but to be able to go against some traditional powers and a very good rain team in the semifinals that got the better of us last year, and to be able to come back and you know we've got a uh, we've got a very good junior group and sophomore group that helped this fantastic senior group that we have. So I feel like we're on the right path. Meanwhile, in the nightcap, Class 5A turned out to be a track meet early. Anthony Puka Williams did what he does best to start the game, finding the end zone on a 26-yard touchdown run. But Zachary was just as lethal with their combo of quarterback Keelan Brown and running back Darwishi Sanders as they stormed back with 27 unanswered points. Puka, playing on an ankle less than 100%, 
did what he could, but the Tigers' magical playoff run came to an end despite 210 yards from their star running back on 36 carries. Pass out to Zach, um, they stopped me. I mean, we ain't play our best football game, and they just came out here and put the, went to work. He'll go down as, as one of the very greatest players in the history of prep football. Um, we were laughing today. We did his, his career statistics, and uh, he's rushed for almost seven miles, you know, so uh, that, that's a pretty good four years labor. Reporting on a wild weekend of high school football championships, I'm Chris Hagan for the final play. And here are our final high school player of the week nominees. Edna Carr, lineman, offense and defense. First on offense, 402 yards rushing in the championship game. Then on defense, they got after it with 11 sacks. West St. John running back, Killen Duhay, had 120 yards rushing and two touchdowns. And Hanville running back, Anthony Puka Williams, another fantastic game for him, 210 yards rushing and a touchdown. Voting runs Monday through Wednesday on our website. Just log on to fox8live.com slash player. Still to come, we'll take you to the Smoothie King Center where the Pelicans battle the 76ers and their former LSU Tiger, Ben Simmons. You're watching the final play. They're not going to go 0-82. They've beaten Golden State, and I told you, they, it took a LeBron James three-pointer to beat them the other night. And so they're going to play. And so we have to play also. And we get control of the game, and then we, we screw around. And then we get control of the game, and we screw around. And when, it, when you do that, the end result is that when it comes down to the stretch and they have to make shots, there's no pressure on them. There's no pressure on them. And so that's what happens, you know. And so we'll look back at this and we'll say, oh, my God, I can't believe we did that. Well, we did it. That was Alvin Gentry following Friday's embarrassing loss to Sacramento. Question was, would Gentry calling his players out still resonate 48 hours later as they welcomed former LSU Tiger Ben Simmons and his Philadelphia 76ers town? Pick this game up in the fourth quarter and Simmons showing some skill on the reverse dunk. 108-107 pals. Simmons finished with 27 points and 10 assists. Pels respond, though, with the three ball. First, Drew Holiday. He had 34, five three-pointers on the evening for Holiday. Then next time down, Anthony Davis, his three-pointer, made it 114-107. A.D. with a big 29 points tonight. Pels get the win, 131-124. They're now 14-13 on the year and will be in Houston tomorrow night. And that's our show for tonight. For all of us here at Fox 8, I'm Juan Kincaid. We hope you'll join us again next Sunday night for the final play. From Fox 8 Sports, this has been the final play.